Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to the Teachers Talk Radio Sociology event. This is the first event of the year for us and we're so, so excited. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've got some absolutely amazing speakers joining us this evening to talk about all wonderful things to do with sociology. Um, we've got John Pullinger joining us as our keynote speaker. We've got a talk from Matt Pinkett. We have Emma and Nikki uh, speaking about assessment. We have the wonderful Ed Brooks and also our very own, uh, own sorry, Kim Constable, also known as the Hectic Teacher. Um, we are streaming on all the different social networking platforms. If you have joined us through the link, though, for the webinar, you can add any questions into the chat. Uh, we are also recording this event as well, and it should be available about an hour after the event uh, finishes. Um, if you are kind of like wanting to add any questions at any point, please do so. You can also add any questions um, over on Twitter for us. Um, if you do, um, please, can you try and use the hashtag uh, TTRSOC? So we are picking those up for you. So um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. I might as well just get on with things um, uh, nice and early. So I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, John Pullinger, uh, in a moment. He's going to be talking about getting sociology student thinking. Uh, just a bit of background on John, just so you're aware of who he is. Um, he is a retired higher education lecturer in sociology. Um, he's written books on sociology. He has degrees in sociology. He has so much information that he can offer us, and we're so, so excited to hear from him. So without further ado, I'm just going to get on with things and hand over to John. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is John Pullinger. Welcome to my short sociology presentation. Kim Constable of Hectic Teacher has asked me to deliver a keynote speech on developing sociology students' subject interest. I hope teachers watching this will find one or two ideas included to be helpful. I'm the author of a number of sociology texts, the most recent being Sociology, An Introduction and Beyond. My experience in sociology lecturing started with A-level students and I then moved on to access to HE and university foundation courses. So my approach here will be very generic to pre-university level. So on to the first main slide. Nurturing students subject interest. As the slide suggests, I'll be looking particularly at this point at developing student interest during the early stages of their studies. Sociology may not necessarily be a student's first choice subject, but taken to make up a programme of study. In fact, it seems these days students are more attracted to study psychology. These students may need winning rounds and may even change their degree subject applications, if you're very successful at this. So sociology has great potential for absorbing student interest, but developing it can be very challenging. How can we start this process? I would suggest, first of all, ask students why they've chosen to study the subject and what their expectations are. Try to encourage a sense of intrigue in the subject to develop their student curiosity. E.g. through sociology you'll view the world differently and with great insight. However, it's important to alert students to some of the challenges that they will face. Many will be new to the subject. How can we ease them in? Embracing sociology requires a great deal of patience and application on the part of students. This is likely to be a new type of language, new types of conceptual thinking, which they will find it quite difficult to adjust to early on. Mental dexterity and open mindedness, for example, moving between perspectives will be particularly important. And I think it's important to emphasize the possibility to students that their early experience will be one of disorientation as they try to adjust to the demands of the subject. So guiding your students through the sociology gateway. 
Your starting point has really to be the experiences and worldviews that they bring along. How can we transition students into sociological thinking? Encourage students to transition their awareness from the personal to the social. And here we're trying to aim towards an awareness of social structure. You might start by asking students, why are you here? They'll probably give very personal reasons, but then change the question somewhat and ask, but why are you all here together right now? And what is your current role in this room? From where did you get the idea that your education and perhaps going to university are so important? You might then touch on free will, individual agency, and move on to social influences, pressures, and social structuring. Building on the idea of social structure gets students to think about socially structured, unequal starting points in life, life chances. Encourage students to think about relating the profile of their life to socially structured inequalities through key sociological concepts then. How much of their life course is determined by life chances and decisions made? How much do social inequalities open up or even restrict these very decisions that they might make at certain points in their life? So we're really looking here at explaining this foundation concept of life chances this is a structural concept, but when we look at life course, we're looking at the actual flow of life, life profile as it unfolds. So get students to consider how key past decisions may have impacted on their life course. Then to consider to what extent unequal life chances determine, and that is a very strong term of course, determine life course. We can then come back to the idea of individual agency and social structure. Questioning unexamined common sense. Encouraging students to make the transition from unexamined common sense to sociological analysis. I use a meritocracy ex exercise for this. In comparing the ideal type with reality, they're likely to find significant differences between the two. So what we're doing here is we're encouraging students to step back and by applying this key concept to try and analyze contemporary society in terms of what the concept would actually show in its ideal type form. So you need to explain very carefully the concept of meritocracy as being to do with a society which would enable individuals to progress entirely on their individual effort and ability. Now, common sense assumptions often leave this concept unexamined and politicians do like to encourage us to think that our society is quite meritocratic. But we need to ask, what would such a society really look like? Try and encourage students to develop an ideal type. Such prompts you might use could be healthcare provision, education provision and opportunity, and inheritance. Get them then to carefully compare this ideal type with contemporary reality. Reconsider the idea of social structure, life chances, and life course. And of course, it'd be a good idea at this point to provide social mobility data for comment as well. Relating personal experiences to broader social influences. Well, people are often encouraged to focus on causes and solutions to personal troubles at the personal or the micro level. Why might this be the case? Well, 
perhaps as a distraction from recognising structural influences and the risk of elevating public issues that require action. So ask, what do we mean by personal troubles and press students for examples? Ask, is the cause and remedy at just a personal level? Consider how might personal troubles have been impacted by social forces originating in the social structure? And if so, they may best be viewed as public issues that require social intervention to help to alleviate them. It's worth encouraging students to link personal troubles to social structural influences and to consider relevant public issues and action. Encourage students to examine personal troubles in terms of a realistic balance between individual responsibility and the need for social reform. This on a case by case basis. So you might ask students to consider how they would analyse such personal troubles as job insecurity, pressures on child carers, homelessness, each on other than a personal level. A great way to engage students is to scrutinise a contentious topical issue. This can provide introductory inroads into future sociological topic areas. In this particular instance, I'm suggesting that a very contemporary issue of the miscarriage of justice regarding sub post masters and sub, and sub post mistresses could be a very useful way of achieving this. Encourage students to actually research these areas. Show the ITV documentary on this. And then examine from the angles of power broadly defined, corporate crime, social elites and mass and social media. So you might raise the questions, what is power? Who holds it and how is it used? What is corporate crime? How is it viewed and punished compared to street crime? Who are social elites and how may they work to protect their own interests and what might be the consequences for others? What is the role of the social media and mass media in raising public issues? Touching on sociological perspectives early on is important, but students may find a level of abstraction initially disorientating. Encourage them to re-examine their experiences from the vantage point of sociological perspectives. Explain the need for patience and that perspectives will keep emerging as increasingly familiar frameworks throughout their studies. The first two points here are quite obvious, but we do need to remain vigilant, really. Vary tasks to different students' needs. Restrict lectures to mini lectures. It's also very important to provide constructive and prompt feedback. Otherwise, opportunities for progress are delayed and students are likely to become dispirited and demotivated. Emphasise, though, to students the importance of keeping assignment deadlines. They should not be seen to benefit from late submissions and the possibility of feedback from other students' work. Especially early on, verbal feedback to written back up would be particularly important. Structure and clarity of assignments is always important, but especially early in the course. At this stage, bite-sized assignments, whether assessed work or classroom work, would be important. Always add how to improve to any criticisms in assessed work, and even in very strong work, suggest potential ways to improve. 
Within the classroom, you might consider using pair or group work in defining and giving examples of key sociological concepts. Open feedback up for classroom discussion. Be supportive where possible, but gently correct any misconceptions. Think of using multiple choice exercises, for example, on sociological perspectives to test how well they have been grasped. Short essays might be set on viewing topical issues sociologically. As part of their learning curve, we need to think about preparing students for transition to higher education. The importance of meeting assigning assignment deadlines and penalties for not doing so is now vital preparation, which should have been going on anyway throughout the course. So too is increasing student responsibility and independence in their studies. This now brings us to an end of the presentation. Thank you for following. I hope there have been one or two pointers that you've been, have been of use to you and wish you and your students every success. Thank you so much to John for that. Um, it was such an interesting and informative presentation. I think it's so important to get our students thinking sociologically and with some wonderful tips in there. Um, I particularly liked the ideas of getting students to relate their personal circumstances to those kind of like wider social issues and really making those um, issues really contemporary for them as well so they can see in real life what's happening and how interesting and contemporary sociology is. So thank you very much to John for that. Um, moving on to our next speaker then, uh, we have Matt Pinkett um, speaking with us next. He is, hello. Hello mate, you are. Yeah, you're you're right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, Matt is going to be doing a talk on being a male ally, um, a guide from safe to stupid. What a brilliant title. Um, Matt's the author of two books, uh, Boys Don't Try and also Boys Do Cry. Um, love both of those titles as well. Amazing books. If you haven't had a chance to read them, uh, definitely worth giving those, um, those a read. Um, Matt's also blogged and written for several publications, delivers regular CPD on this topic of teaching and masculinity. I think it's a, a topic, Matt, that's so important at the moment. Um, I think everybody can probably agree that there are too many incidents of misogyny, sexism, harassment in and outside of school. And actually having that culture where we can call out boys and boys can call out each other as well is, yeah. is really important. So I'm really excited to hear um, your talk. So I'm just going to hand over to you now, Matt. So thank you very much. Cool. No worries. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, do I have to share my screen, don't I? Sorry. Um, I'm so useless. Uh, how do I do that? Oh, here it is. Uh, present, share screen. Share screen. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, select a tab to share. Uh, sorry, bear it's with just me. Just annoying, Pinkett, aren't you? It was oh, all no, going so well. Right. 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 You're right. Okay, can can you see that now? Um, uh, can you see uh, a screen that says securing male allyship? We can. Yeah, yeah. Over Brilliant. to you then. Thank right. you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah. So for people that don't know me, um, uh, I'm an English teacher. I've got a GCSE in sociology. I think. Um, it's a good subject. I enjoy it. <laughs> but you all know that. Uh, so um, what I want to do today really quickly is just talk to you about um, being a male ally. Um, I want to kind of draw on, on two things, really. Firstly, I want to talk to you about what I talk to students about in terms of how they can um, hold each other to account. Um, uh, basically how boys can call out other boys or call in other boys when other boys are transgressing. But I also want to talk about this study which came out um, a couple of weeks ago um, that really helps teachers to better understand how they can get boys on board with, um, with wanting to be an ally in the first place because actually um, I think it's quite difficult um, uh, on the face of it, there's not a lot in it for boys. Um, 
because often, you know, calling out other men or calling out their mates when their mates are sexist, homophobic, racist, whatever it may be, um, can actually be physically quite dangerous. Um, men don't like to be told by other men what to do um, or, or told they'd be wrong. And also socially, it can be quite marginalising and isolating. Um, it's very difficult, for example, for a 15-year-old boy uh, to tell all his mates off uh, watching some pornography or... or um, you know, laughing at a sexist joke. Anyway, uh, this research study gives like kind of five tips about how how we can get boys on board with um, with being an ally. And so I just want to talk through through all of those. Um, the first uh, the first recommendation the report makes is that we need to meet men where they're at. And I think that's a really interesting sort of question. Like, where are we at? Um, we know that the majority of people who die by suicide are men. Um, we know that men in the UK are twice as likely to be victims of violent crime, particularly on the streets. Uh, we know that 99% of sexual abuse perpetrators are male, according to police statistics. Uh, we know that 90% of murders uh, committed in the UK last year were by male perpetrators. Uh, and in 2023, um, nearly 100% of the prison population was male. So that's where men and boys are at. There's a lot going on. Um, and I think we need to understand that. We need to understand that boys and men are vulnerable. Um, but that's not also forgetting that societal or so, you know, societal um, and cultural input means that um, they're more likely to commit these quite heinous crimes, despite there not being any sort of biological pre disposition to to do so um so how can we meet men where they're at um if we want to get boys and men on board with uh being an ally we need to avoid kind of blame and shame stances on masculinity we need to recognize that that men and boys um are victims too and i don't even just mean on a general level i mean each boy and man is an individual there'll be boys that you teach who have been beaten up who have been abused who have been bullied um, you know, every you know, who are suffering with eating disorders, mental health issues, and I think often um, we forget that with particularly with young boys. Um, research has shown that you know the loneliest people on the planet are, are, are men, um, aged between you know 22 and, and 49. Um, you know, men are lonely, um, close, intimate male relationships become stigmatized around about the age of 15. Um, um, it's largely due to homophobia, really. Um, so what we really need to do is focus on building relationships with men and boys to get them involved. Um, what we also need to do is we need to create safe spaces for boys to talk. We need to realise that men and boys, um, we do need to be able to talk about our own experiences. And sadly, what that means is um, a lot of the stuff we'll hear will, will just sound like a load of horseshit to, uh, to, to other people. Um, you know, we've had all the power, control and money um, for, for centuries. Um, and we didn't really have to do anything about it. We just had to be born with a penis. Um, and now all of a sudden, um, rightly so, um, people are realising that that's really unfair. Um, and it is unfair. But also we do have to kind of understand why um, some of these men are actually thinking, do you know what, this is a bit annoying. My dad had the world and now... Now everything I do is being called into question. Um, boys in particular, research backs up that, you know, they need these safe spaces. Um, but we do have to be careful, you know, places like locker rooms, um, school changing rooms, uh, particularly sports clubs, that sort of thing, male-only safe spaces, often pubs and stuff as boys get older, can actually reinforce gender norms and toxic masculinity. Um, and so what we need to do is start looking at how we can teach boys and men to call each other to account. Um, my guide is a, is a research informed guide based on safe to stupid. And I go around and do workshops with kids on this sort of thing. Um, research has shown that, you know, the silent treatment is really effective. If a boy makes a, homo, uh, you know, a homophobic or a sexist comment um, and everybody in the group chat or everybody in his friendship group says nothing. That's a really effective way of reducing the likelihood of that boy offending again. 
Um, there's uh, one study that showed when um, a perpetrator of a sexist comment sees everybody around him awkwardly looking at each other and reading the room as if to say, Jesus, what did that guy just say? That's even more effective than silent treatment, uh, reducing the likelihood that he will um, sin again. Um, of course, I always tell boys, you know, it's not cowardly to act later. If in the moment when your mate says something sexist, uh, you know, and you don't feel strong enough or you don't have it in you or he's like the alpha of the group and it's really difficult for you to, to say anything then, well, that doesn't mean your chance has gone. OK, if something is making you feel uncomfortable hours, weeks, even months later, go and tell somebody about it. It works. It really does. Um, sarcasm has been shown to be really, really effective. Um, also, direct challenge. So actually saying to another man, perhaps you see him harassing a woman on a tube train or your mate makes a sexist comment on the playground, actually saying, Oh, wow. Yeah, that's well night. Oh, wow. What a modern man you are. How brilliant. You know, sarcastic. Also direct challenge saying what you're doing is wrong. Um, it really does work. Research has shown that verbal remonstrations work. However, the research also shows that, um, you know, I saw one study that said 77 percent of the time, if a man is directly challenged by another man, he will react with violence or aggression. So I always tell kids, you know, you'd be stupid to do that in public and put yourself in danger. I always talk about this sweet spot called the soft challenge. Now, the soft challenge still has the verbal remonstration effect, which is really effective. But what it does is um, it takes out some of that kind of you language and kind of softens the blow. So what I teach boys to say is um, the phrase, come off it, mate. So when you say come off it, it's less aggressive, less confrontational than what you are doing is wrong. You need to stop. Also, if you add a little nickname or mate on the end, it also reduces the chances that your friends will just think that you're just being an, an asshole. And really what you're saying is, look, I am still your friend, but you know, I, I, want, I want to remind you of what you're doing is wrong. And you are my mate and I, and I don't want to lose you as a friend and I'm looking out for you. Um, the report, sorry, I've got one more minute. The report also says we do really need to focus on gender equality leaders, um, particularly male ones to other men and boys. I mean, I'm quite, I, I, I don't know what I think about this. I, I think it does huge disservice to the amazing women, uh, female teachers, the majority of our profession, single mothers, even mothers who aren't single mothers, but, you know, dad's always at work. Um, pe women who put amazing work into raising their sons and their children. Um, but the research does show that, sadly, you know, boys do um, look to men for, to, for, for, to, to lead them. And so we do need to, to make sure that we are pro providing boys with these kind of caring, tender adult male mentors. So often in schools, particularly, the pastoral male is the tough behaviour guy that normally an XPE teacher that walks around in tiny little shorts bellowing at the kids. But actually, boys need to see that there's a caring, tender man there that they can go to if they want. Um, we do need to think about those, you know, those places that can often be quite toxic, but actually do... Um, you know, many boys do look forward to being in so like sports team, male only clubs, religious spaces, cultural gatherings, places where they've got large influence on boys life and how we can use them to get them involved in allyship. Schools are great and key life moments are good. Puberty, adolescence, kids are really receptive then. Fatherhood's a good one, too. And finally, what we need to do is we need to embed a feminist and intersectional approach. So we do have to remember not all men are straight and white. Not all boys are straight and white. We need to think about the way we adultify young black boys. On average, we judge young black boys to be between two and four years older than they actually are. That's a real problem. Um, we need to think about cultural differences. We need to remember that not all men are straight. Some men are gay. And just because those men are gay doesn't mean that they aren't masculine or haven't been gendered to be male. Um, and, you know, every boy and man is different. Uh, just a final word. Um, there's a direct quote from this um, from this uh, study that says, you know, this sort of work is not for everyone. All right. And I understand it. There will be women 
who are, you know, have it a lot worse than men, who are victims of routine abuse and subjugation for who listening to boys talk about how life is hard for them could be actually quite difficult. But there is great need for those who are willing and able to hold and create space for the inevitable mistakes that come with getting men on board for transformational positive change. And inevitable mistakes is what we must expect because virtue signaling is the enemy to male allyship. This idea that you have to be perfect and have to have been born into the world and raised into a world without the influences of toxic gender expectations upon you, it's just ridiculous. So we need to accept that boys will make mistakes and we need to coach them through them. Cool, right, I think I went on for 11 minutes there instead of 10, but um, I hope that you got something out of it or found it interesting, um, cool. Matt, that was that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I think everything that you said was amazing. I think, um, especially as the mother of a young boy, it's something that I'm hyper aware of now is trying to make sure that, you know, like you say, he has those positive male role models, but also is as he grows up and inevitably, like you said, they're going to make mistakes. He's called out on that behavior. Um, you spoke about creating like a safe space for boys and that being really, really important. And I think Sometimes the struggle in sociology, and it's something I found sometimes, is there's obviously a big emphasis on feminism and we talk about women's rights and it's all very focused on girls, girls, girls. Yeah. And that sometimes can lead the boys feeling they've been blamed or they're ostracised or... And that can be a little bit difficult. So how do you recommend uh, approaching talking about toxic masculinity and, and all of these things with boys when you are, a fe especially if you're a female teacher? Do you know what? I think one thing you need to do is ask them what they think. I do you know what? It's funny you say that. So I remember for my A-levels, I took sociology, drama, English literature. Um, and across those three A-levels, um, I was one of only two boys in all three classes. Now, drama, sociology and English literature very, very heavily, rightly so, on feminism. Um, but as a 16, 17, 18 year old man, it was really kind of frustrating for me. I was often made, you know, in drama, I was always playing a rapist or, you know, and in sociology, we always listen. It was it was difficult. And I just wish a teacher had said, Matt, are you all right? Or like, Matt, how are you dealing with all of this new stuff? Um, so yeah. I think, you know, discussion is really important because people like Andrew Tate and all that lot and all his, all his cronies are telling boys that we don't care about their opinions. So we need to ask boys. We need to show them that they do have a voice. Um, and and I, th I think that's really important. Okay, that's, that's a really good tip. I mean, I just constantly feel like I'm saying sorry to them. I'm like, I'm sorry, we're talking about this. I'm sorry, we're talking yeah. about this. And you, you, I mean, you can't egg apologize. shells a little bit. I get it, yeah. It feels off apologising for feminism, but I, I do get it, yeah. I, yeah. It's yeah. difficult. I think we're still all trying to, yeah, trying to uh, work our way around it. But I think um, a lot of the things you spoke about, like I say, I think it's a, a massively important um, uh, subject. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to join us this evening. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matt. Sure. Um, right, OK, so we are going to be moving on now. Um, we're going to be hearing from em um, Emma Sperring and Nikki Espiner, who are going to be looking at meaningful and manageable assessment. So both uh, Emmy and uh, Emmy, let's try again, Emma and Nikki. <laughs> them now. Hello. Uh, Hello. They're both Hi. heads of social science um, at a school in Leicestershire. They both teach sociology psychology, law and criminology. So you've yeah. got a lot on your plate when it comes to assessment. So you're probably best placed to be talking about this today. So um, I'm gonna hand over to you two. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, luckily for us, um, we've got some help with some technical issues we've got. So uh, Kim in the background is helping us with our PowerPoint. So thank you so much, Kim. <laughs> um, so we wanted to talk really about um, assessment because actually for us, as you've said already, Jodie, it's quite a pertinent sort of topic, if you like, um, having so many different sort of subjects that we spin. Um, it's, it's important for us to therefore make sure that what we're doing is meaningful for our students, but it's also manageable so that we're not taking loads and loads of work home with us. Or if we have work, it's a manageable workload. Um, I don't know if it's possible um, backstage, if you can get our PowerPoint up now, if that's possible at all, because I can only see Emma. 
you see enough of me you don't need to see me and anymore <laughs> never never enough darling um so this is what we thought and actually it fits really quite nicely at the moment as well with um what we're currently doing in our trust so our trust is currently reassessing assessment in general um and how we can make that um or basically having a consultation with our staff about how to make that um, more effective. So it seemed, as I said, quite a pertinent thing for us to bring forward um, and share. Um, so yeah, if I can get the next slide, please, Kim. <laughs> Thank you, darling. So just to just wanted to give you a little bit of context. Obviously, um, Jody said at the start that we teach multiple A-level subjects. We took over as joint heads of department three years ago. And it was a small social science department, but it had a lot of subjects in it. it had criminology, sociology, psychology, as well as health and social care. But in the three years since we've took over, not to do with us, but just the way things have worked out, the department's grown massively in size in terms of pupil uptake. So we have we're a relatively small sixth form college with approximately 200 ish students in each year group in year 12 and 13. But the overwhelming majority study at least one of our subjects, if not more. So we've also recently introduced law, which has been incredibly popular as well. So when we started, it was pretty much just me and Nikki teaching. And then it's grown to quite, quite a significant department. Now it's the biggest department in, in the sixth form. And then last year we had two ECTs join us as year one ECTs. They're in their second and final ECT year this year which has also changed our focus as well, because Nikki and I are both are very experienced teachers, but to have new, fresh teachers in who have never, who, you know, they've come from training, it's about looking at how to manage things with, with fresh eyes. And we are both um, perfectionists. We're both um, a little bit, we like to know what we're doing and organise and things like that. Um but we also are, we like to think we're quite progressive and we're always looking for new ways to do things and better ways. We're quite reflective. And a big thing for us has been about assessment. We wanted assessment to be really meaningful and have an uh, impact, a high stakes impact. But we didn't want it to be at the expense of our department, myself and Nikki included, but also for our two young staff, because we know recruitment and retention is such a, such a big issue at the moment. We wanted to make sure that they were OK giving all of this impactful feedback, but that we weren't making them or they weren't feeling like they had to work every hour at school and as, as well when they got home. So that's where we've sort of, that's our starting point. So Kim, could we have the next slide, please, my lovely? Thank you. So as Nikki said at the start, we've been talking in our trust about um, assessment and how we develop it. And again, that's on top of as a result of feedback about um, staff wellbeing, but also the impact of assessment. And obviously we know as A-level teachers that we, the tendency as Nikki will talk about in a minute is to do lots and lots of, lot of, of exam questions. And indeed when we took over, that was the norm. They were doing exam questions daily, every lesson and staff would take them in, mark them and so on and so forth. And what we wanted to do was sort of shift the focus to make sure that we were considering that everything we do when we're in the lesson from the minute the students walk into the minute they leave is a form of assessment and whether that's the activities that we do and we do lots of things that we'll talk about in a moment that then inf helps inform our teaching but also it's the feedback we then provide to those students to make sure that the learners improve because obviously these students are doing A-levels they want they may want to go to university it's about their outcomes as well and how to how to get the best from them. And what we felt is it was important that when they were completing written assessed work exam questions, that we were giving them the acknowledgement that we valued what they were doing, but that the feedback we were giving was valuable and timely. And rather than taking everything in, it might be a week, two weeks to get everything marked, that we could be a little bit more instantaneous and actually have a bigger impact. And that's really where we've we've kind of developed our, our way of doing things. So could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, yeah, so from our point of view, I think it's, as, as Em said, it's very, very easy, I think, with us having exams as, our, you know, exams as our ultimate focus at the end, that assessment becomes everything related to exams. And ultimately, as teachers, then that's falling on our shoulders for us to assess and piling up into a particularly huge workload. 
And I think when you then pair with the fact that sociology numbers have shot up like they have done, so it's the fifth most popular A-level choice and there's 45,000 entries last year, um, with, like we talked about earlier on, teacher retention dropping as well, that means potentially larger class sizes and lots of students, but actually you've still got to make sure those students are making progress um, and you're assessing them on a regular basis. So for us, it was then the reflection of, how do we make sure that what we're doing is meaningful um, for the students? And like Emma said, allowing students to develop and learn from what we're doing in lessons, but also not then at the expense of us or our team in terms of well-being and workload. So it's it's like what John was talking about earlier on, actually, and the idea of assessment and feedback needs to be to be quite a quick turnaround to make sure it has the most impact. Um, sorry for this again, Kim. Can I have the next slide? Lovely, please. Do you want to go first, Em? <laughs> I can do, yes. So what we thought about is what sort of strategies do we utilise in our classrooms to keep the wellbeing workload balance, but also prepare our cohort in the best way we can? So we use um, a huge amount of live marking. Um, and that can be linked with the mini, with mini whiteboards, for example. We'll put a question on the board. We'll get them to write it on a little whiteboard. And they'll hold it up and we'll go around the class and talk to them about it and get them to share ideas. And that that's particularly effective if, for example, on um, paper one and paper three, where you've got fours and sixes, that's a really quick way of gauging that they understand and they can answer the questions. But also they understand that the, the structure that they need. Um, we use it that as well in 10s and 30s and 20s when we've got hook questions and we are trying to tease, particularly in year 12, where they they can be a little bit they can struggle with it teasing the hooks out of things so we'll use the whiteboard and say okay here's the item write down what are the hooks and then we can very quickly see what we, what they're doing and we can then get them to model answers on there we can do q a knowledge in terms of low stakes quizzing using the whiteboards but we can actually even use it for longer questions such as yeah. um, 20s and 30s because we can do um, modelling of some elements and get them to do a bit. And again, we can walk around the room and wander around and, and see what they're doing and talk to them. But also the students like it because they don't like to get it wrong. So they like to be able to rub it out if we go, oh, that's a lovely idea and I can see what you've done, but I need you to add this or structurally mm. this isn't quite right. Do you mm, want to take that's it. it? It's as well, like for today, we were doing, um, in my lesson today, we were doing ethnicity and crime, and I've got a question that was one of Kim's actually, um, about um, rates of offending and uh, statistics related to ethnic differences in, in um, crime deviance. And allowing the students to then look at the question, pick it out, discuss it, write points down on their whiteboard, and then I put some prompts up and then encourage them to then say, right, okay, so there's your point. How do we develop the analysis then? Where's the explicit evaluation? Who's your person that's going into this paragraph? So by able to have those whiteboards, just being able to kind of structure it through for them means that's going to take the edge off when some of the essays do come back in because actually we've built that structure and like Emma said and modelled it. Um, one thing that we do an awful lot is post-it plans. So if we're doing um, assessments where we're actually getting to write, a lot of the questions that we will do in class we will do in timed conditions because what we do find is particularly year 12 they will spend ages writing these lovely essays for us and what will happen is it will take them hours to write it and then when they get to you know their, their assessors in class they then can't do it under the conditions that they need to so we give them um, a post-it plan quite early on you have a post-it you can write everything you want on that post-it but if it doesn't fit on there you can't have your notes with it with you and then we gradually make those post-its a bit smaller and wean them away from them all together so it's practicing that time in and we're also kind of building those scaffolds in as well aren't we we are i mean we do when we're doing the post-it plans and doing any assess piece of work and obviously as i said we assess and as we all do we assess from the minute they walk in the room but when we're talking about more formal assessments and writing what we do find is that, as Nick, Nick said, the students write such a lot, but they can't replicate it. So when it comes to a mock exam, they, they don't do as well because they use they, they like to have 30 minutes to write a 10 mark question, which is you know completely unfeasible. So we also spend a lot of time getting them to, and teaching them to honestly reflect on their work. And we find yeah. it often goes in sort of one or two ways. Students will either reflect on their work and say, that's absolutely brilliant. It's, a, it's 10 out of 10. 
or they'll reflect in automatically <laughs> and I can I can think of students in my head that do this and then the other the opposite end of the spectrum are the students that will look at a really great piece of work that we yeah. would give them an eight or a nine and they'll give themselves a two yeah so it's about sort of encouraging their self-assessment and we're very keen and we're very our, our big sort of focus for the for the students is you're never going to be in trouble for getting it wrong yeah but you will be if you don't try and we're yeah. very lucky our students are are always quite net they it's quite easy to teach them to be willing to, to to have a go and we spend a lot of time reviewing and getting them to self-assess their work so they might do um a question and we'll go through and say okay i want you to highlight where's your point where's your explanation where's your evidence where's your person where's your link back to the question and what are the keywords of the question so if it's evaluate the usefulness of functionalist approaches um to crime and deviance which is what i've been doing the key is the usefulness and linking it back and then the explicit evaluation and we'll talk to them and say okay what about the explicit evaluation if this is our point what's our explicit evaluation point and where is yours and get them to pull their work apart and say okay where's your bits but we do it with a positive framework so nobody ever feels yeah. I can't reflect because if I reflect I'll get in I'll, I'll have got it wrong and then everybody will take the mickey or everyone will you know pick, my teachers won't think I'm any good at it everything is done in such a really really positive yeah. manner isn't it yeah. absolutely we've always very much like does it matter if it's not right we're still learning it's it's that yet yeah, bit um and we you know our ECTs are amazing we're incredibly lucky mm. and one of them's made almost a, like a checklist and when she'll do things on whiteboard she'll bring the checklist up right highlight on your own work where you see this where you see this where you see that and, and then and then getting the students to reflect on their own pieces of work. So when they are doing essay questions, we'll often give them a mark scheme and that checklist first and say, you read it and check yourself where you see these things, then we'll read it. So it's encouraging them to be reflective as well as us then taking it into market. And, and again, we do a lot of I do, we do, you do. So things on the board that we can then discuss, model, walk through with them, construct a little point paragraph develop it and it goes back to the point and we was saying about that safe space for the students to learn it's allowing them to feel like it doesn't matter at this point if I get it wrong because I'm just getting there so by building the confidence it's allowing us to, to check what they know to circulate and see to look on those whiteboards to look at their pieces of work and then allow us to really deep down understand where they are sitting to allow us to move them forward but we do a lot of low stakes stuff um as well don't we um you're better with retrieval emery the queen of retrieval <laughs> i wouldn't quite go that far <laughs> um yeah we do a lot i mean obviously when we're doing our essay questions we don't we do tend to we stick to a peely paragraph so and the students are drilled from the moment they come in and we're very lucky we have um our key stage four sociology teacher teaches them incredibly well yeah. so our if the students are coming from our academy into our college a lot and they've already done sociology a lot of them have got have got yeah. those sort of basics in place but we are relentless with a peely paragraph so as soon as we <laughs> say right it's a it's a 20 or it's a 30 you need your peely paragraphs they know what that means but then again as soon as we're we're going back into if we're doing a 30 or a 20 we'll say to them again it's peely paragraph so remind me that means what and we'll go back over it with them yeah and say you know we you know we forget on any given day what we're what we're doing so remind me again what does the p mean what does the e mean and we'll we'll model it so we'll we'll put a hook question for example and say okay where's our point where's our evidence okay where's our explanation how are we linking and we'll do that with them and mm -hmm. we find if we because we all stick and there's four of us that teach sociology because we all stick to peely the students are very well versed in it and those students that we have that that insists we read their work before they self-assess we when they first start we let we do do that but we do at some point go I'm not going to read it now I want to know I'm genuinely interested in what you think I will read it afterwards and they do get used to it because the, the culture is such that they they know we're going to check it we, they know we're going to help them if we if they need it they do become quite comfortable with that quite quickly because it's done consistently by all four of us all the time they're quite they're, they're quite used to doing it aren't they they are definitely and the one biggest thing i think as well that we do quite a lot of and again bless one of our ects amazing did a brilliant student survey drilled right into it to find out exactly like what the strengths were how the students felt that they were getting on so by doing that and all these other little bits and pieces it allows us to have a really good understanding of where our students 
feel that they are and ultimately assessment is such a reflective thing we're constantly checking everyone constantly checking where are they in terms of the retrieval the structure all these other things but then it's allowing us to be reflective on that assessment as well and go actually that didn't quite land properly let's go back and do that so I know the biggest thing for for us and if I can get you to go to the last slide Kim if that's not uh, not last next slide Kim if that's not too much trouble one of the things we've taken away and again I don't know if this is this is helpful Em if you want to talk through this is something we implemented didn't we when we took over yeah so and this builds on what some of the questions that that people are asking about how often we assess so when we assess obviously we do low stakes stuff all the time but in terms of assessments under time conditions that's still done very regularly but what we do do is because we have classes and we have two teachers per class we do tend to coordinate so we don't so a class doesn't get two questions in in a week because that's that's a bit much bit too much for them um other than when we're in sort of revision mode so we do i would say uh timed conditions questions probably every couple of weeks there is a form of a timed question but that for example because we're on crime and deviance now that may be the form of a four a six so my class our class next week with me are doing a four a six and a ten in time conditions but last week they did a 30 with nikki so it we we balance it out between them but what we do because when we are doing timed conditions and we and we're going to market we need to make sure we're helping ourselves and helping our well-being and we use feedback sheets which we nikki and i have developed and taken some structure that was already in place but made it more workable for us where the students have always got the mark bands and they become quite familiar with them and again we keep going over and over it with them but then there is a sheet and one column is feedback so that's um things that we're saying you're doing you're doing well at or you're developing and that, that's looking really good and we will tick or highlight those and then the action are the elements we want them to work on and we we work on that and other than that we don't write a huge amount on their work we may we, we tick through the bits we've seen. We'll often underline where we see the person highlight. and highlight. Um, we might write where they're giving um, examples, like our AO2 examples, which our students struggle with, because I, I don't know if it's similar in other colleges. Our students have no general knowledge at all. God bless them. <laughs> they, they just, they, you know, they exist on TikTok. They have no, <laughs> have no, they don't watch the news. So we spend a lot of time embedding the AO2 and we'll underline and highlight that where we see it. But we don't write a lot because what we know is for our students, obviously this is, this is for us purely, our students don't necessarily read the comments. They look at the mark at the end. And if we're mm. writing loads on it, we're wasting our time. And often we're writing exactly the same thing. But then what yeah. we do do is then when we fill these in, we'll often find there's a common theme that, some, that, that they've missed. And again, we'll reflect, say, OK, that bit's not landed right. So we'll go back and say, right, we've, we've marked these and there's a lot of you that are struggling with this bit. So now let's look at this question. Let's model this. Let's talk about this together. And again, a lot of that's then done verbally. And the students then with we use uh, like purple pens, but they'll off use different color pens as well. And they will then annotate their marked essay back rather than us writing the same thing 60 times, which is no a waste of our time, to be honest. And that's what it was like when we first took over, wasn't it? We were writing the same thing. And that's where this kind of came from of we're writing the same stuff over and over. So let's just make it easier and tick and highlight and pass that on. Um, Kim, if I can get you to get to the last slide, I'm going to promise we'll, we'll shop. <laughs> um, for us, the biggest thing I think to take away is I think everybody who's watching as a teacher knows how to assess. And I feel like we're teaching grandma how to suck eggs here. But these are strategies that have worked for us that have made our workload more manageable when it comes to well-being and, and, and assessment. Um, so anything that even if it's something small that you take away, um, hopefully that will have, you know, that was our plan so to just share a few strategies and uh, things that we've got. So, so thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you ever so much. Thank you. That was so useful. Um, do you mind if I just have a couple of questions before? Yeah, before you it. run off. Um, there's a question, uh, Lily, in the, the comments was talking about the fact that she's um, an ECT one and she's got 60 year 12 students, which is, yes. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Um, mm. yeah. If Obviously, you've gone through like a, a number of different strategies there, but if you could give Lily like one one strategy or one piece of advice to help her with the, the marking and feedback, what would it be? I, I would start by saying be kind to yourself. You're a year one ECT. Um, 
we as so Nikki and I've been teaching for a long time in particular when you combine the years together and we, we still don't always get <laughs> yeah we still don't always get this right um I would say that if feeling bad about how long it takes you to mark and feedback that will you will speed up speed up with practice as well but it's things like for example if you're writing the same thing over and over again don't write it you need to go go back to the class and talk them through it and get them to add it to their work rather than you writing it and if I mean it depends what school you're in and depends on what the what the culture is but if you're able to use like genetic like feedback sheets that you can then adapt Mm -hmm. so that you're ticking or highlighting things rather than having to add comments it it does speed up and I suppose the other the final thing I would say is is sort of stagger what you're doing so if you've got 60 year 12s you can't assess them every you can't assess them with with written assessed work every week or every fortnight because that's that's an absolutely obscene workload so it's about being strategic which is why if you're doing say smaller questions in your within your lesson using whiteboards or something that may cut down some of your marking as well I don't know what you think Nick I'm, I'm the same I was going to say I feel like one of the biggest things that we've put in that's helped us is this far feedback sheets because just by going through and being able to tick and highlight rather than having to write the same comments over and over again um i think that made no end of difference but also for us like we we push a lot more on live marking and i think being able to do live marking is is a massive help and i think takes away a lot of um a lot of unnecessary feedback that you can literally give over the shoulder of the student rather than having to sit and copiously write and like emma said be be kind to yourself look after yourself because 60 is a lot so, but yeah. our ECTs <laughs> did the same. Thinking about last year, our ECTs did the same. Every question they did was a formally yeah. assessed question, and we we had something that said you you don't need to do it like this. And they came, came and watched us and went, "Oh, okay, I can make it a bit e- easier on myself, but still impactful." Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think it's. I mean, I've got two ECTs in in my department as well, and I think sometimes you forget, don't you, how when you first start and get how much longer these kind of things take and they get they yeah. do get easier it's one of those things it does yeah. get easier doesn't it as the years yeah. go on um but that's really helpful i'm going to be really cheeky and mm. ask whether maybe your feedback sheet if it's something we could maybe share so it might help i'm sure we can have a look i'm sure we? we can do that yeah. <laughs> we're really fun. cheeky and live so that you can't say no <laughs> but no that <laughs> might, be, might be really useful so um yeah let me just double check if there's anything else i think you covered most of yeah, you covered most of what these. The only there's just one very very quick one because I know mm. we're at the time. Um, you spoke about obviously a lot of students focusing on the grades rather than the comments. Do you ever get to a point where you just don't put grades on, or you just give like a band mark or something just to try and get them to focus more on the feedback rather than the mark or the grade? That's a great question. We never have, have we? Actually, we've we always know. kind of. We've always floated around it. Do you know what? I think this, this is going to sound absolutely bonkers. Emma and I have brought in, and um, our ECTs are the same. We've got stickers. So almost like, don't worry about that. That's where we're at. Progress is where we're going forward. So we bring out, um, as silly as it sounds for A-level students, stickers. It's almost like, yeah. look, that's fabulous. It's feedback. This is how we're moving forward. So we've, we've never really thought about grades coming off, I suppose, have we? But maybe that's something that we can consider. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think we've done it in okay. when we do mock papers we have but then they'll go online and find the grade yeah. boundaries yeah that's it <laughs> there is that there's always a way around it but no just worth asking but thank you so much for that um both of you that was really useful and so many like great tips for us all I think to use whether thank we're ECTs you. or 10 20 years into the the business I suppose so thank you very much thank you for having us lovely right okay so next up we have um Ed Brooks um ed brooks is going to be talking about some extracurricular uh, extracurricular kind of activities that can happen and trips that we can do and this is all focused on washington dc um he's going to talk through um some of the opportunities that that exist in washington and how we can utilize them in sociology so i'm going to hand over to ed now thank you Ed Brooks and I am an assistant head teacher here at Wyndham College in Norfolk. I'm head of one of the boarding houses we have here uh, with 75 boarders and a further 130 day students as well as a teacher of sociology and PSHE. I've been doing trips for over 10 years now 
uh, a full range from small academic half day trips to full academic half day and activity trips right up to week long international trips right across Europe um, and recently the States. The trips that I've taken have ranged from anywhere from three students right up to over a hundred. Very short session I intend to briefly review a six-day trip that I ran in October 2023. I'm going to aim to outline the process for organizing Washington DC as a combined social sciences opportunity and how it's differed to other trips I've run. Uh, I'll add on some common snagging issues around trip organization you probably ought to consider as well. Hopefully there'll be something in this for everyone whether for the seasoned trip organizer someone considering running a trip for the first time or whether or not you're just volunteering to try and get involved. To begin, what trip did I run? Well, this trip was a six day, four night uh, residential trip to Washington DC in the United States. And we ran it in our October half term. We departed from our school on a Saturday morning of the half term, flew overnight Saturday evening, landing very interestingly, Saturday night, and spent then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday visiting numerous sites of significance, which I'll come back to later. We flew back to the UK on the Wednesday night, landing Thursday morning, uh, before making the coach journey back to Norfolk. We took 18 students in all, aged 16 to 17, and from a range of subjects, which I'll come on to now. To begin, why a social sciences trip and why Washington DC? Uh, in my view, the social sciences trips that I've seen tend to be mostly museum based in years seven to nine and very narrowly focused on a very particular topic at a very particular time in the curriculum. As students get towards GCSE and A-level study, I've found that trip opportunities reduce in frequency and ones that do exist are usually either the battlefields tours or visits to the parliament buildings. Washington gives you a mix of all of those from war memorials, political buildings, museums, as well as just that little bit more due to it being a residential style trip. For A-level study, particularly the politics A-level, there is a unit on the American political and judicial system. Therefore, for many of the site visits, there will be curriculum relevance. The White House, the Declaration of Independence, the two bodies of Congress are all sites that can be visited and will benefit understanding when returning to the classroom. For other A-level subjects, there are other learning opportunities that can be tailored for your trip. For sociology, visits to the museums of American history, the American Indian Museum, or the African Art Museum can all provide some cross-curricular links to structural inequalities that can be factored into contemporary examples in essays. For law, the Supreme Court and the Capitol provide excellent opportunities to speak to officials and tour the exhibits about differences in law and bill creation. And the Lincoln Memorials and MLK Memorials provide good hinterland opportunities for discussion around civil rights, particularly if you're accompanied by a guided tour. For history, visits to Ford's Theatre where Lincoln was assassinated, to Arlington National Cemetery with its guided tours, or to the countless historical monuments littered all around Washington, provide overlaps to many areas of history units. References throughout visitor centers to visits from foreign leaders was also particularly useful for many of our students. For other subjects, there will be less direct but more indirect appeal to Washington, and there can be lots of crossovers there. Georgetown University is in Washington, DC, and visits could be organized for those thinking of studying abroad. The museums of natural history and botanical gardens can appeal to science and biology students or you can get the american experience and go shopping see a baseball game at nationals park which is within washington or go further out for an american football game in virginia how was this trip different to other trips that i've run well uh, firstly on the activity style most international trips I've led have been activity based with external providers operating the entire trip. For example, water sports trips, scuba trips and so on. The Washington trip, in my mind, uh, and with just limited knowledge of going with a particular provider we did, 
was more akin to running several day trips in a row to different locations. Some will have a guide, some may not. If you want a trip fully provided for you to act simply as a passenger, it will be worth discussing with your provider long in advance what services they offer. Secondly, uh, was the range of activities. There was really a wide range of things to choose from based on the different museums available and the sites available. On the day we were leaving, I had a conversation with another school group who were arriving, who were off to Ford's Theatre that afternoon, something that we hadn't done. However, they weren't doing two of the other activities that we had done in our four days there. Next one will be food. Now this may be provider specific, but we were required to either arrange dining ourselves or let students go in search of lunch and dinner options. Uh, luckily our hotel had a bar restaurant, so that sorted us for at least one night. Uh, bear in mind you are in a city setting, so prices are going to be a little inflated. Also, if you're a group of more than 15, expect to aim to book way in advance with some difficulties being that size. Travel. Well, most UK or European trips will be on coaches, but obviously traveling this far means flying. It's going to mean being familiar with airports, being comfortable with letting students roam for a little while in terminals uh, and making sure visas or waivers are ready in advance, which do need applying for. Lastly, the timing of the year. We traveled in October, which meant gathering funds across two academic school years over the summer holidays too. Most other trips I've operated run within a one year frame, so it's worth having a considered thought as to whether you and the staff team will all be still there next academic year. Or alternatively, would you be happy to run a trip later in an academic year when you're closer to exams or in the very cold months of February and March? issues to consider with an international or an American trip. Firstly, around phones, data and communications. Most locations we went to provided Wi-Fi, making communications back to the UK or within your group very easy. Depending on your establishment's trip planning system, you shouldn't find emailing back to the UK tricky therefore. What you might find challenging is communicating on the go, so it'll be worth speaking to your establishment about data and minutes packages for you to use in the USA, or potentially purchasing once you arrive. Do make sure to budget for either. Next will be traveling around DC. Again, dependent on your provider and activity choices, you may have coaches or minibuses for some excursions, you may not. Yes, you are in the middle of a city, but things are very far apart in Washington DC. For example, it's a mile from the capital to the White House. We purchased Metro cards, which come in one day, three day or month long passes. We purchased the three day option for the final three days of our trip, making travel much easier around the city. Again, you ought to budget for this. They can only be bought in DC at an underground station, so you cannot get them in advance. Next up is around allergies and medicines. For those with any complex medical needs, they will likely be familiar with traveling with their prescriptions and medications already. But to give an example, I cannot carry an emergency EpiPen on a flight without an accompanying doctor's letter stating whom it's for, potentially when, and with I must alert the airline in advance. If needed, this will take a bit of time to arrange. Then, when in the US, it'd be worth getting your provider and tour contact in DC to detail medical emergency routines for you, just in case. So hopefully that's given you a bit of either a bit of an insight into running a trip and why we picked Washington DC. I realise there's been a very short amount of time that I've been talking. So if you do have further questions, please feel free to email me on the address listed here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Ed Brooks for that. I think Washington is probably somewhere that most of us haven't considered for a trip. So it was really interesting to hear about the different opportunities that are available there. So thank you very much. Okay, so last 
but by no means least, we have our very own Kim Constable, obviously more famously known as the Hectic Teacher. So Kim, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know a lot of people are already very aware of who you are and how fantastic you are, so I don't need to go on too much. But um, what I am going to say is that this idea of using AI um, in the classroom, I think it's something that I'm 50% excited about, 50% it scares the hell out of me. Um, I'm, it's something that I'm really interested to find out more about. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I think actually I might be more 70 scared and 30 excited about the use of it, but I'm really interested to see, to hear what you've got to say. So I'm going to hand over to you. Um, so thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think AI is one of those things where people are either terrified of it and Rightly so, when you've got films like Terminator and things like that, where AI goes completely insane and takes over the world. Um, but I'm a complete technophile and I really like using tech. So when AI stuff started coming out, I was kind of like, oh, something new to play with. Um, and that's what I've been doing really over the last year or so since it's all come out and chat GTP and all of these things have come out. I've just been messing around and playing and seeing what I can do and what the capabilities are. And we're still very much in the early days of AI. So there are glitches, there are things that aren't gonna quite work the way we want to. So what I want to try and do in this talk is kind of talk about the things that AI can do to support us in teaching sociology, what its limitations are, and then hopefully, if this works the way I think it's gonna work, I can show you three of the websites that I use and how I use them to support my planning and things like that. So the uses and limitations. AI can be very, very useful. Um, it can help us with finding up-to-date studies. It's one of the common things that we complain about as teachers is we don't have time to search through journals, read through journals, and all these things to try and find studies that are more up to date. Our textbooks were written in 2015. We're now in 2024. It'd be nice to be able to have some of those more up to date studies. It can help with writing comprehension questions. And I'll show you a website that I use to do that, where you upload the text and it, it can create questions for you. Same with key term lists and glossaries. Um, it can write what I call improve me answers. So these are where you give a model, but it's not a perfect answer, but an answer that students can then use to kind of go, well, you need to change this or this wasn't quite right. When it comes to planning, it can provide starting points. It won't do your planning, but it will give you some ideas. Um, for some reason I've got that on there twice, but never mind. And when you have got long texts and things like that, that perhaps you don't have time to read or you just want a synopsis for your students, AI can summarize it for you. And the bit I love best as a dyslexic person is that AI can be my copy editor. It can, I can put upload information or upload a text to it and it will rewrite it for me so that it actually makes sense and deal with any typos or grammatical errors that I might have in there. But as I said, it does have its limits. It's not going to do everything for us. It won't do our marking for us. Unlike some other subjects where the answers are a little bit more straightforward, with sociology, particularly essays and things like that, where it is more opinion based, AI currently hasn't got to the point where it can do our marking for us. Also, students write in handwritten format. And I don't know about other people, but students that I teach, some of their handwriting, I can barely understand. So there's no way scanning it and uploading it is going to get um, the computer to understand it. It won't write your lesson plans. It can give you some ideas on the activities you can do or how to structure maybe the content of your lessons, but lesson planning is quite personal. Uh, we all have our own different ways of 
um, running a lesson and how we like to teach. I very much like flipped learning. I, my co-teachers, Ed Brooks, who you've just uh, heard from, he write, he teaches in a different way. So AI can't plan our lessons for us, despite what some of the websites tell us. It also won't write a top band answer for you. You can upload information, you can upload mark schemes and things like that, but I have yet to find an AI system that can write a band five A-level answer or a top band answer where I'm not looking at it going, it, it, it just doesn't feel right, it doesn't read right. And also you do answers. Sorry, I disappeared for a minute there. Um, it doesn't always give accurate answers. You do, it will fill the gap with something, but you need to check the content for knowledge and understand it for the knowledge side of things and just make sure that it is giving you the right sociologists or the right terminology and things like that. So how do I use AI? As I said, there are three main websites that I use, and I'm really going to hope this is going to work, um, but that support me when I'm planning or when I'm do making resources and things like that. The first one I'm going to talk about, and this is where I'm going to hope that my thing works, uh, which one I've done, is, yes, it's working, um, is illicit.org. And illicit.org is a research AI. And what that means is, is it searches out research papers. It searches out journals, um, sociological art, um, documents, and all these things so we can get more up-to-date studies, more AO2 for our students. And it's a really straightforward website to use. So you go to illicit.com. I have, because I use it quite a lot, I have a subscription, but you can use the free version. You just type in a question or an area. So if I wanted to find about a domestic division of labor in the UK, and then I can search and it will look over thousands and thousands of academic papers and it will eventually come up with various dot, um, articles that I can then use and I can then filter it so I can filter it first of all by most recent so it will change it to give me what the most recent ones it could find I can also filter it to has a pdf so that means that's a free download for the pdf rather than being behind a paywall and I can also click to add more columns in so main findings and it will tell me um, what the main findings are, it will tell me what has been measured, and you can even adapt it so that you can then add in if there's a particular thing that you want to look at. And what you can see, as you can see on the screen, it tells me the paper, gives me an overview, main findings, and measured outcome. And what I can then do is, because I've asked for a PDF version, if I click on that, it will take me to where I can get that PDF from here. And we're not gonna do that now because it will then come up with a, a new screen. Find out where I've gone, there we go. Um, so I've used this to find up-to-date studies that are not in my textbooks. Uh, for example, I'm just doing ethnicity representations in the media and I found a brilliant article on indigenous representation in the media, which I've summarized and will be using in my lesson on Thursday with my year 13s. And my school at the moment is very much into reading and improving reading. So this gives me a, a tool to use with that. It also gives more contemporary AO2. And I have used it for homeworks where I've said, I want you to go and find a study on this, tell me, and given them a kind of an outline of this is what I want you to, to, to know about this study come back and we can discuss it in relation to what we're discussing in class. So it's a really good website and it's not just for sociology, you can do it for psychology, um, I've used it for law, we've used it, I've used it in PSHE, we've used it for um, teaching and learning groups as well. So it's a really nice website for doing that. 
The next website I use is Pop AI, and this links into um, that previous website when I found my PDFs. Uh, that one. Um, and Pop AI is an AI that works with PDF documents. So when you have a PDF document or a Word document, you can pop it up into um, the AI. And again, this is something that is free, but you can have a subscription for as well. Um, and they've just added a load of new features to this website that I haven't played around with yet. But for example, um, I took a copy of my textbook page uh, that I was looking at for ethnicity and crime and uploaded that. And the first thing it does is it does an automatic summary for you, as you can see here. So it gives you an overview of what it's talking about. And then what I really like is it starts giving you questions. And you can use those questions as opinion questions, comprehension questions, and things like that. What I then asked it to do, skip that bit, um, is I asked it to identify the sociologists that were in the text so and what they said. So it went through the text and it pulled out Hall and Hollingsworth and Cottle and um, all of the sociologists that mentioned and just gave me a snippet about what they said, which can be turned into a flashcard or it can be turned into a matchup activity that you want the students to do. You can ask it to create a glossary of terms and it will go through and pick out terms that are useful. So not only is this useful for you as a teacher if you want to summarise a text, but it can also be useful for students who perhaps um, struggle with reading or struggle with note taking, that it can pick out elements and pick out ideas on what they want um, students to do. Now, as I said earlier this week, I found an article on Alyssa on Indigenous people in the media. I uploaded it and then I asked it to give me opinion questions that I could then use in class. Um, I asked it to give me more information about a particular element of the text and it gave me a little bit more information. And then I got it to ans ask me questions. Now, generally, when I ask it to create questions, if I'm looking for three questions to use, I'll ask it for six. Um, but what it also does, as you can see here, is it tells me where in the text it got that information from. So if I want to go directly to the text and find that information, I can. Now, Pop AI has now also got a system where you can create a presentation. Um, so you put, type into the presentation what you want it to do. It creates an outline, creates the presentation, then you can edit it and um, make it your own. But I haven't played with that yet. And I, these are all brand new features that I haven't quite got to with Pop AI yet, but I will be playing with and messing around with in the future. It, again, it won't do it the, exactly how you want it, but it can give you that baseline, which might save you a little bit of time and as somebody who sometimes struggles with just taking that first step, AI has really helped me in kind of pushing me forward and getting me out of the rut of I don't know where to start. Now, the last AI system I use is ChatGTP, and this is probably the most famous of them um, and has been around for a while. And again, there's the free version. I subscribe to it because I have uh, because I use it quite a lot. But this one is kind of my copy editor. So I when I do my flipped lectures and I have my transcripts from them, my transcripts tend to be quite random. They'll have all the ums and ahs and repeats and things like that, because I don't go back and edit my um, lectures. I just record them. So what I then do is I upload sections of that transcript to chat GTP and it turns it into legible writing and it turns it into something that is understandable. I still have to check through it just to make sure it's got the content correct but it, it's a lot quicker than dyslexic me trying to edit my own work and generally will make mistakes. It can generate answers and examples or evaluation points. So an example I've got here um, I'm just done gender and ethnicity 
with my uh, sorry gender and media representation with my year 13s so i had an essay question of evaluate the view that the media reinforces traditional gender roles and i just asked chat gtp to give me five points that answer that view now they're not particularly sociological but they give me that kind of starting point where i can kind of go all oh, stereotypical um portrayals or i can link that into Katz's study of um oh god what's it called tough guys too um under representation of women in powerful roles i can link that to symbolic annihilation and tuckman um reinforcement of gender roles so it gives me an idea of where i can start and how i can then apply my sociology i then asked it to um redo it but using sociological terminology and then i asked it to evaluate so I evaluate Tunstall's view of women being represented in traditional roles. So it then gave me some evaluation points in um, favor and against. Again, it's not doing the work for me because I, ha I have to then, and if students do this, it's not doing it for me because they have to make it sociological and they have to put it into a format that works for whatever task you've asked them to do. But it does give them a kicking off point, especially those who struggle with starting. As I've said, it also gives me improve me answers. I'll put a question in and say, write me an essay that's an introduction, three main body paragraphs and a conclusion. Here's the mark scheme. Here's the question. And then I use that answer to get my students to improve it, to make it better, to make it a band five answer. Because I do struggle sometimes of writing a middling essay one that's not so bad it's awful but be also a top band answer where a student will look at it and kind of go well i can't do that i get it to do explanations and simplifications if there's a term that i'm not sure on and when i'm googling it i'm still kind of i don't understand it chat gtp will put it into language that i can understand because i can keep just saying write it as though I'm a 16 year old GCSE student and it will put it into language I can understand. So there's a lot that AI can do for us. There's a lot it can't do, but I have found it has improved my workload a little bit because I do tend to go down the rabbit hole a little bit and mess around with it. But it does get it, especially with my dyslexia and things like that. It gives me that kicking off point which then my brain can kind of go, ah, oh, yeah, that's how I can take it forward. It's gonna go, it's gonna be a long time before we get to AI taking over and we don't have to worry. It is not gonna write our students essays. You can very, very quickly tell if a student has used AI to write an essay, um, especially when they don't take out the bottom bit where it says, I hope this is okay or something like that, um, which they do um but i think ai is a tool to add into our workload and i really hope that you, this has given you some ideas and maybe alleviated some fears on what ai is and what it can and cannot do thank you thank you i think the percentages have changed a little bit i'm a little less fearful having gone through that and actually while you were going through that i opened up um, <laughs> another tab with the illicit one for the research paper because actually that's one thing that i massively struggle with is trying to get that contemporary research in without you spending hours and hours trying to find something so that will yeah. be um, i think a bit of a game changer to be honest um so really, really useful. Has I was me. that yeah i mean i was going to ask you about how you approached it when students were maybe overly becoming overly reliant on things like GTP, G, whatever it's called. But um, you, yeah, as you I said, mean, it, it usually is the, pretty clear, isn't thing, it, when they've used it? Yeah, yeah. It it doesn't write as creatively as a human does. You you can, and our students, we get to know their writing from when they're doing stuff in class. So when they hand something in, you're looking at it and you're kind of going, "You didn't write that." Yeah. Um, and I've had one student who did do that. And when I went through it with them afterwards, I was kind of like, well, can you tell me what this word means? And they had yeah. absolutely no idea. I was like, well, that's obvious Then you didn't write this. Take it away, yeah. write it yourself, give it back to me. Um, but it is, it is really, I think the tools are becoming better, but we're still in the early days of it. So it'll be interesting to see how it develops. 
it's it's good to have some pointers of where to start with it though and I think that's what a lot of us need it's that confidence to kind of go okay I can use this and I, I can use it and it won't it'll actually make my life easier so that's that was really really brilliant so thank you very much yeah um Kim my favorite one is the okay. pop AI where it can take the a very long 30 page document and give it to you in two paragraphs yeah oh the summer yeah the summary would be useful <laughs> but yeah the illicit one is my first is going to be my number one stop I'm definitely going to have a little look um at that one so thank you for that so that brings us to the end um of our evening so I want to say a massive thank you first of all to everyone that's joined us this evening I know how busy everyone is and I know how tired everybody is um so we're immensely grateful for you like stopping along today and, and listening to to all of the talks that we've had Obviously, thank you so much to all of our guest speakers. Um, it's all been amazing. Um, so many things that we've learned. and It's so great to hear what's going on in those sociology classrooms across the country. Thank you to Tom for handling the tech side so that I didn't have to do any tech because as we have now found out, I'm scared of tech. And just enjoy the rest of your evening. Enjoy half term when it comes and hopefully we'll see you at our next event. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.